Okay, so now we're going to switch gears and start talking about SQL, everybody's favorite language. It's not really a language, it's not a programming language, it is a scripting language. Well, it's a communication language for databases. And so uh, the lecture that I'm covering right now is called 5B, Lecture 5B. It is 136 slides long. We're not covering all of that today. We're going to cover it all the way up to another probably about 45 minutes at the most, I think. I'm going to try and get us out of here by 5.30. So we'll see what happens with that. As soon as I find a good stopping point, I'm going to cut it at that point. But what I want to do is try to get through some of it so we don't have to do all of it tomorrow. So what we don't, what we cover today, we don't have to do tomorrow, obviously. So, so what are we going to do? Introduction to SQL. So in terms of SQL, what we're looking at why SQL? It's a very high level language, obviously, um, in which programs are used to enable to speak with databases, to manipulate databases. As we've seen so far, we have DDL and DML commands that we use for both data definition, data manipulation. I think I've drilled that into you long enough already. Um, we also have an optimized version of SQL that's used with P PLSQL that's also used with SQL Plus for Oracle and the Oracle database system. We have a bunch of variations of SQL in terms of proprietary commands that have been added to the language. What we're going to look at, to, well, mostly for tomorrow, what we're going to look at is the basic standard SQL language, which works with all databases, not just Oracle. So this is equivalent to your basic SQL for generic everything included database which means it'll work with Microsoft Access, MySQL, SQL Server, and Oracle, and other databases. So what you're looking at here is the basic format. We have the select from where. So what I have on the slide here is a principal form of the query. So what's in the slide set that's in blue is the command. And I've got all my commands in capital letters. SQL is not case sensitive. So you can write these in caps, you can write them in small, you can mix and match. What is sensitive are words for searching and for comparison in the WHERE clause and in the condition. Any conditions that are set, it is case sensitive, but in terms of the syntax of the language, it's not. So we always have these three components in every SQL query that we create. It's a select from WHERE, where the select is the desired attributes, like select first name, select last name, select star, select sum of something. The from is always going to be the database and uh, it's going to be the database table I should say. So one or more tables separated by commas or just the table name. And then the where is the condition about which the rows of the table we want. So classic would be select star from user table where first name is equal to such and such. So it's written out like this but it can all be written on one line as well. But it's common to see SQL statements written out into three lines so that we can have it separated out and clearly identify what tables we're using, what select we're using, and which where we are associating with this. So, For this slide set, and I'll remind you of this tomorrow when we start in, we're going to use a basic table set. And here it is here. And most students like this, well, actually most undergraduate college students like this because it's about beers and bars and stuff. Uh, but what we have going on here to make it interesting for you is an example set of tables because we need something to query. So we have all of the queries that are going to be performed in this lecture that we can practice are going to be on this schema. So this is our database schema example. Underlining indicates the key attributes for foreign keys. So we have beers, we have bars, we have drinkers, people who drink beer. We have likes, people who like beer. Uh, we have sells, so we know which bar is selling which beer that people like to drink. And then we have frequents, so we know which people frequent which bars and like which drinks. So it's all about knowing which beverage you're going to get and where in terms of this database design. So usually by the end of the lecture, which is not going to happen until about noon tomorrow, most people want to drink <laughs> because, <laughs> especially me. However, I'll have to space myself out because I have to make it through the day. <laughs> but <laughs> don't don't be uh, don't be surprised if you feel like having a beer at the end of this lecture. <laughs> so here's an example of the first query that we're going to look at. And the example says using beers, and beers has in it name and manufacturer. What beers are made by Anheuser Busch? 
We could probably all think of these beers already, but like Anheuser-Busch makes Budweiser, makes Michelob. Uh, it doesn't link to that I'm familiar with. I'm sure that they make other ones. So they do imports, but that, no, I don't know. And I don't know what they sell. Anyway, the query would look like this, where we have select name from beers where manufacturer is equal to Anheuser-Busch. So this is our first uh, first query because we need to know what beer is made by Anheuser-Busch. And we know that Anheuser-Busch here is going to be having this hyphen here, in which this is case sensitive with the hyphen. So when we do the equals, we want an exact match. There's other ways of doing this query, but this is the, the basic one we're looking at. The results of the query that we're going to get back are going to look like this. Because we asked for the name, and we only have name and manufacturer in this table. So we're only going to get the name back. So the name is going to show up here. And lo and behold, we have Bud, Bud Light, and Michelob as three beers that are made by Anheuser-Busch that are going to be in this, this table that we've got going on here. So the answer is the relation with a single attribute, name and rows, with the same for each one of the beers in Hazard Bush, such as Bud and all the rest of them that came through. So it's going to pull the data exactly how it is represented in the columns in the database table. So the meaning of the single rela relation query, what is it, what we're doing behind the scenes here, we begin with the relation in the from clause this is what the query engine is doing for us in the behind the scenes. We, we start with the from, then we apply the selection indicated in the where clause, where manufacturers equal Anheuser-Busch, and then we apply the selection projection. So we extend the projection, indicate by the selection clause, and then we apply it so we can get the name, the manufacturer, the whatever it is that we happen to be looking for out of that database. So what does a language do to implement the algorithm, which you don't have to worry about, it, but if you're designing your own database, you'd be implementing an algorithm to implement this logic. Think of the row variable ranging from each one of the rows in the relation mentioned in the from. And then uh, check if the current row satisfies the where clause. If it does, include it in the results. If not, move on to the next one. So it does really a row by row selection to check each one of the rows to see if the where clause is actually being satisfied. Which makes us, you know, think about that index again. If we're checking an index, we can actually check faster, which makes it a little bit easier. So a lot of people um, can actually create indexes on things that you're going to, or would actually create indexes on things that you're going to search a lot. So if you're going to search on a manufacturer a lot, it makes good sense to index that as well. You can create more indexes above and beyond the primary key. The more indexes you create, the better the searching is but then double it for updating speed again. So the more indexes that have to be updated every time you, in, you upload something, update something. So think about the concept. If so, we, um, if the row is in the results, then we can compute the attri uh, attribute of the expression of the select clause using the components in the, in the row, and we give the results. So everyone likes the asterisk because it brings back everything without having to mention anything. Because when you run a query, you actually have to know the names of the fields that you're looking for. Here, we use the asterisk as a wild card. So where there's one relation in the from clause, an asterisk in the select clause, uh, stands for all attributes in this relation, which means bring us back everything. So select star from beers where manufacturer is equal to Anheuser-Busch. We're going to get the beer name, and we're going to get the manufacturer, because the star is going to say give us everything. It's a little bit inefficient to use this all the time. Because people go, oh yeah, I don't have to worry about the name, just select star. And then what ends up happening is you have to take this result set and you have to parse it with whatever application you're going to use it with. And then you've got to go through all of the data and pull out all the little pieces of information and then stick it in each one of the <laughs> variables that you're looking for. A lot more data to go through. So it's a lot better not to use the asterisk unless you want all the data. So now the results of the attributes looks like this. So we have name and we have manufacturer. We can also rename attributes. So if we don't like the way that the attribute looks, we can give it another name. And here's an example. If you want the results to have a different name, we use an as with a new name uh, to rename the attribute. So here we have an example based on beers. Beers has name and manufacturer in it. So select name as beer. So we're gonna, it's going to be called beer now instead of names in the result set, uh, comma manufacturer. So now we're selecting two attributes. One of them is being renamed. It's not an alias, but it's a rename on the results. 
Uh, same as before, from beers where manufacturers equal to Anheuser-Busch. So now we have the word beer here instead of names. We accomplish that by using an as, so as beer instead of name. We could have called it beer name, I guess, if we wanted to. Why do you want to do that? Well, because maybe you're sending the attributes and you're sending the results somewhere for a web application to go parse and you want to label it so that it's self-identifiable. What's name going to give you? Nothing much. <laughs> name of what? So it would be beer name or beer or something that would give us a little bit more information about the column, a little bit more ability to sort of troubleshoot that. Um, this is kind of redundant, actually. We know the manufacturer is manufacturer is Anheuser-Busch on this query, so this is kind of, I don't know, not very optimal, but uh, it works for this particular query. We can also put expressions in the select clause. So an expression that makes sense for, might appear in an element of the select clause, for example, from cells, bar, beer, and price, select the bar, comma, beer, price times 120, and then we're going to go as price in yen. This is where the rename of the attribute makes a lot more sense. Well, beer and name is kind of a nice rename, so you know what it is. But in here, we have the word price in yen that shows up. It's actually not really a real word, but it's an expression that we're going to use. Price in yen, how do we know that's not price in, in pounds or price in some of the dollars or something? And we've done a calculation here, price times 120. We could have easily put price times 120 up there. If we have left out as price in yen, it would have been shown up here, price times 120, which wouldn't make any sense either, especially if I was looking at it. I go, what is price times? Price in yen. Oh, OK, so then I know it's yen kind of thing. So it's helpful to be able to label and to rename the attribute values that are showing up in the results set. And so in this case, we have a price in yen. So we can also put a constant expression in the results set, which makes the results more reasonable, or makes the results more readable, I should say. So from likes, where we have drinker and beer, select drinker likes bud as who likes bud. From likes, where the beer is equal to bud. So I'm going to show you what it looks like. It looks like this, where we have drinker Sally and drinker Fred, who likes bud. And we have likes Bud, likes Bud, likes Bud. So I don't know. I like Bud Light, so I probably would have changed the expression for me. But at least I know that Sally and Fred like Bud Light, and that's what I'm doing the query on. Oh, excuse me, Bud. And that's what I'm doing the query on. So I can run a query again and change who likes and make it who likes Bud Light, for example. And then I would know that Sally and Fred likes Bud, and then Barbara likes Bud Light if I ran the query, if I was in the database. So then I'd be able to be able to tell the difference between who likes what and the query results. Because I can run the queries one after the other. Actually, I could run them together if I wanted to. And uh, basically be able to interpret the results to know what I'm looking at. Because the worst thing you want to do is take a bunch of results and go, what is this? What are these numbers for? Oh, it's just a printout. It says cost. Is it retail cost? Supplier cost, manufacturer cost, what cost is this cost kind of thing. And it came from a supplier database, so the cost is the retail cost, is the manufacturer's cost. But you don't know that when you're looking at the results set. So the as rename of the attribute allows you to sort of make it a little bit more self-explanatory. We can also put complex conditions in the where clause. So we can say in this particular case, from the cells database where we have bar, beer, and price, find the price that Joe's bar charges for Bud. So select price from cells where the bar is equal to Joe's bar and the beer is equal to Bud. And I won't call that complex, but we're using an and. We can also use an or in here to say one or the other. And it'd be used the same way. A couple of things to note about this query, and I think it's in the next slide, is the use of the double quotes here, the double expression, because we have an apostrophe s inside of a quote so we're gonna have to put a double apostrophe to say that this is actually can't the first one cancels out the second one in this particular case that makes it so that it doesn't know it's there so important points two single quotes inside of the string represent the single quote apostrophe this is what I just showed you a few seconds ago another point is in the where clause we can use an and an or also could we can use a not 
And then we can also put parentheses in there. So we can parenthesize it. So usually the way Boolean conditions are built, so we could, oops, put in here, you know, a parenthesis, Joe's bar, and another parenthesis, maybe beer is equal to bud, if we wanted to clear that out. We don't actually, this is kind of simple, but we could say, you know, where beer is equal to bud and Joe's bar, uh, where bar is equal to Joe's bar and Mary's bar and Peter's bar and, you know, all these bars or something. We could do it that way as well if we wanted to. Also, SQL is case sensitive. In general, upper and lower case characters are the same, except inside of the quotes and the string. The strings inside of quotes are case sensitive. So we want to make sure that this is, we know that this is case sensitive. Everything else isn't. When you write the queries out as a general practice, I like to put the keywords in caps. Because then I can look at that and go, there's the select, there's the from, there's the where. And I put them on three different lines. So this is on purpose. You don't have to. You can write this all in one line if you wanted to. Not quite as user friendly when reading it, but it does the same trick, does the same job. We also have patterns, so if we don't know exactly what Joe's bar is called, or we don't know what Bud is labeled as, we can use a pattern to find that out. So where the, the where clause can be a condition in which the string is compared with a pattern. So we have an attribute, and then we have a like, a pattern, or we have an attribute with a not like, which is the opposite of a like, which means it's alike, similar. So the pattern is a quoted string with the percent sign equals any string, or the underscore is going to be equal to any character. So here we have an example of it from drinkers, name, comma, address, comma, phone number, find drinkers with exchange 555. So select name from drinkers where phone is like, and then here we go, inside of the quotes. So some students forget to put the quotes in there, uh, but you have to put the single quotes in there. Inside, when this is assumed, it's anything. Anything before 555, so we can get 415, 408, 650, any prefix before that. <clears throat> and then we have 555 dash, hello, it's getting too loud. <laughs> One, two, three, four characters that, that precede the dash. Uh, to fill in the blanks in terms of the completion of that. Uh, so this comes in handy when you don't know exactly what you're looking for, but you want to get the pattern. So the like, also you can do not like if you want to as well. We also have null values. So in the Boolean logic, we have a true, a false, and an unknown. So it's a three-way instead of a two. So it's not like is it true or false. We have that third element. And it'll come back with a third element, unknown. So the rows in the SQL relation can have null as a value for one or more components. And that uh, means, or the mean, meaning depends on the context. So we have so two common cases, missing values that come back. So if we don't have anything that shows up, that the, the attribute is empty, we haven't put a non-null, not null restriction on it, and we allowed the customer to put anything they wanted in there, and we did a query on it, and it comes back, it might fall into the case from which we don't know. It's a missing value. It's going to come back as a null. So we know that Joe's bar has the sum address, but we don't know what it is. So it might come back as a missing value. Also, it might be inapplicable. So the value of the attributes of a spouse for an unmarried person might actually come back as being empty or null because it's not appropriate for that person because that person doesn't have a spouse or a dependent or something of that nature. So when comparing nulls to values, we have a three-way logic. Three -way logic. So the logical condition really is true, false, and unknown. So when any value is compared with null, the value that comes back is unknown. Hello. So if it's true, unknown, it's unknown. If it's false, unknown, it's unknown. If it's unknown, unknown, it's unknown. <laughs> Although you'd think unknown and unknown might be false, but it's still unknown. So, uh, so it does work that three-way logic instead of two, but a query only produces a row in the answer if it's true. So where the value is true, not false or unknown. So if we said select this where this is equal to this, it doesn't account for any of the unknowns. So it comes back and it'll give you the wrong count, essentially, because it's only going to give you the true trues. So if the value isn't less than something or isn't greater than something, and there's no value, it's not going to come back and count it at all. So unknowns have a tendency to throw query results off because it makes it so that the results come back unpredictable. Can you guys take it outside?
It's just I can't I can't yell over you. It's too late in the day for me to start yelling right now. <laughs> and I can't, so take if you're gonna talk, take it outside, please. Thank you. Three three valued logic. Okay, so to understand the way it works with the and or and the not works in three valued logic. So we have one is equal true is equal to one, false is equal to zero, unknown is one half. So we have a half value if we're looking at the logic, which doesn't make two halves a whole, which is that doesn't make any sense. So. The and is the minimum, the or is the maximum, and then the not is the opposite, actually, of it in terms of the three-valued logic. So surprising results. Here's an example of some surprising results. So from the sales, from the following sales relation, we have a bar and beer, and the price is going to be equal to null. Select a bar from sales where the price is smaller than $2 or the price is larger than or equal to $2. Well, so we have an unknown and an unknown, which is going to give us an unknown. It's going to come back with nothing. But we think about it and we go, well, it is smaller than $2 if it's nothing. So it doesn't play a part in the results. So it's completely ignored. So those null values end up in a separate category all on its own, which is why you never do a count on a non-primary key. So if you do a count, on a database and say, count the number of students and use the social security number as the count. And some students don't have social security numbers in there, it's not going to count that record, <laughs> even though there's a row in there. But if you do a count on a primary key, then you're always guaranteed because it's not in the table unless the primary key is actually there. Then your count's going to come out with the correct answer, actually, if you do a count or you do a sum or do any calculation on the number of rows, um, you want to use a primary key for that. So here's the yeah, reasoning of the two value law, which is not equal to a three minus value law, a three value law. So it's common, so common laws like the commutative law and and hold a three value logic, but others don't. So the law actually is kind of weird, uh, excludes the middle. So we're missing part of the results essentially when we start looking at the nulls. So we can also run queries on a multiple relation. So a multi-relation query, interesting queries often combine data from one or more tables and relations. So we can address several different relations in a from clause instead of just one by listing them. And so we can distinguish attributes of the same relation by using a dot notation. So we go relation dot attributes. So here's an example where we've got likes and frequents. So using the likes, which has beer and drinker in it, and the frequency table that has drinker and bar in it, find the beers liked by at least one person who frequents Joe's bars. We're trying to see how effective Joe's bar is. So we have to find the people who like the beer that frequent there. So we select beer. So we're only selecting one item, beer, but we're doing it from, because beer and beer shows up in both. Actually, beer shows up in the likes table from likes comma frequents where and we use the comma to separate the multiple relations this is not a join by the way it's a multiple relation select where the bar is equal to Joe's bar and frequents dot drinker is equal to likes dot drinker so we use a dot notation because we have two drinker attributes so if we say where drinker is equal to drinker the query would come back and actually give us a result where it came out with probably nothing actually <laughs> because the query makes no sense. So if we go frequents.drinker equals likes.drinker, then we know we're comparing from this table to this table. We're not joining the tables, we're just taking all of the results from both tables and we're comparing drinker from this table with drinker from that table to see which one of them uh, goes to Joe's bar, where Joe's bar, because we have the and in here, where the bar is equal to Joe's bar, and frequents.drinker is equal to likes.drinker. So that comes in handy to be able to um, take attributes out of two different tables and compare them together. So in terms of the formal semantics, almost the same as the single relation queries. You start with the product of the relations in the from clause, the likes and the drinkers table, and uh, or the frequency table. And you apply the selection condition from the where clause, and you project onto the list of attributes and the expression of the select clause, which is pretty good. So what does the language actually do? It's actually creating two projections and querying them together. So imagine one row variable for each one of the relations in the from clause. And so it's actually querying both tables. So your search space has doubled, actually, at that point, because you're not doing a join. If you're doing a join, you're 
combining them together, then you're searching the join half table, which is, I mean, it's half of the sum of the both of them together, because two of them together is going to give you twice as much, if you think about that in terms of quantity. So these row variables visit each combination of the rows, one from each relation, both of them together simultaneously. So if the row variables are pointing to the rows that satisfy the WHERE clause, in terms of the WHERE clause, you send these rows to the SELECT clause. So if WHERE satisfies, it goes to the SELECT, and you're looking at both of them simultaneously. Here's an example of how it's working where we have table view 1 and table view 2, which is what the TV stands for. TV1, TV2, and <laughs> we're comparing. Here we have the frequency table and the likes table, and we're checking these, making sure that they're equal. But we're going row by row here, row by row here. This is what I was saying before. If you join them together and search the join, you're not searching both simultaneously. You have two different separations, so you move the join higher up on the projection, and we end up with a more efficient. Sometimes you end up with a more efficient query. But the concept isn't that we're joining it. It's two separate tables, so we're not going to do a we're not going to treat it like a join. And here's the output is bud over here. So it checks these values, make sure they're equal, and then we, if it's equal, then we'll send it out and see. Yeah. This is what we found out of there. So we have explicit row variables that we can set. So sometimes a query needs to use two copies of the same relation. So we're querying the table on itself, and we're creating a variable to represent one of the query pieces that we're going to compare with another query piece. We're really querying the table on itself. Distinguish copies for, uh, by following the relation name by name of a row variable in the from clause. It's always an option to rename the relations this way even when you're not doing it and there's no reason to do it. You see a lot of people actually doing it this way just so they can keep track of a shorter variable name or a shorter, shorter um, alias actually. So this is what I mean. So from beers that contains name and manufacturer, find all pairs of beers by the same manufacturer. So we need all beers that are produced by Anheuser-Busch as an example. And do not produce the pairs like Bud Bud, um, you know, and like Bud Light, Bud Light, McGlow, McGlow, so, because we know there's going to be pairs that are going to come out of it. So produce pairs in alphabetical order, and uh, so as, as such as Bud Miller, not Miller Bud. So here's the, here's the trick here. So select b1.name, comma b2.name, and you're wondering, well, where'd b1 and b2 come from? Well, on the from clause, we created two aliases of the same table. So we have from beers space b1, comma beers space b2. Because <laughs> if we said beers, beers, it's going to go, wait a minute, I'm beers. So it's actually keeping track of both relations simultaneously, and it's calling one b1 and the other one b2 and we're actually searching them both and comparing them against each other, row by row, to see where the matches occur. And then by the same manufacturer, 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 manufacturer. So it's kind of an interesting way of querying the table onto itself, with itself. So it's a multiple relation query with only one relation, only one beers table. So where beer one dot manufacturer is going to be equal to beer two dot manufacturer and beer one dot name is smaller than beer two dot name, this is going to give us our alphabetical order. So when we do a comparison on alpha characters in terms of less than greater than, we're giving this is going to be we'll put the smaller ones first than the greater ones. So we'll get the order in a, a Bud Miller instead of a Miller Bud. If that makes any sense? But this is the part here: the beers space B one comma beer space B two. It creates the two aliases. People do this anyway. So even if let's say you just have beer B1, that's it. Then you can say B1 dot this, B1 dot that. It makes it a little bit easier sometimes to refer to the relation. Because what if the relation is called my student data from 1992? And then every time you have to write my student data, let's just call it, you know, just student data <laughs> or SD or something. And then go SD dot name, SD dot date. It makes it a little bit easier, easier as an alias to kind of um, be more flexible in terms of the naming. Lo and behold, we got subqueries. So these are queries, the single valued queries with multiple, single and multiple relations. And then we have the concept of subqueries that play parts. So a parenthesized select from where statement or a subquery 
can be used as a value in the number of different places, including the from and the where clauses. As an example, in the place of a relation, in the from clause, we can place another query and then query its results. So we can nest queries inside of queries. Better use a row variable to name the rows of the results, actually. So subqueries that return one row. So we can say equals to where something is going to be equal to subquery. And the subquery is going to be another query. It's going to say select, star, or select price from cells where bud is equal to bud light. And then we can see we can, we can compare something against a single value that's kind of going to come out of a subquery. Because we have some subqueries that return one value, and then we have sub, some subqueries <laughs> that return multiple values. And so we can say in, like, greater than, less than, equals to. We can all use all some sort of different evaluation operators to test the expression to find the results that we want. So in a subquery, a guarantee to produce only one. Subquery can be used as a value. So usually the row has one component to it. We'll see an example in a few minutes. Also, typically a single row is guaranteed by keyness of the attributes. So a runtime error occurs if no, no row is returned or more than one row is returned. So in our example, from sales, and sales includes bar, beer, and price, we're going to find the bars that serve Miller for the price that Joe charges for Bud. So we're going to find the bar that serves Miller, because we want to pay the same thing for Miller as we do for Bud, that, that Joe's bar charges for Bud. So we have two queries, find the price that Joe charges for Bud, and then find the bars that serve Miller at that price. So this is what the query looks like. And so we've got the query plus the subquery solution. Yes, you can run this as two separate queries, but then you're looking at two separate queries and you're taking the value that comes out of the first query and you're manually substituting, substituting in to the value from the second query which I see all the time actually people want to say you know select okay find the beer find this price select the price this is the second query so select a price from cells where the bar is equal to Joe's bar and the beer is equal to bud I got it it's five dollars actually it's probably more like six dollars these days but okay, six dollars all right this is the price at which Joe said, and then people would rewrite this query and put six dollars. <laughs> but then what happens if the database changes? And then you've hard fixed it. If you're if you're producing that, I see this all the time actually, because you look at this and go, that's not what I'm buying. Wait a minute, that's not the price. Where'd that price come from? No, that's not comparable. And then the results are totally wrong because they hard set the value. They like pre-ran the query, took the query result hard set it in instead of actually just running the query inside of the query so you can get up-to-date results because really if I ran this query tomorrow well tomorrow's probably gonna be about the same but let's say next year I think the price of bud is probably gonna go up I don't know I remember when beer used to be three dollars there's still some bars around here you can buy actually if you go to that poor house bistro on the corner the bud is three dollars but light is three bucks it was there a couple of nights ago <laughs> but, <laughs> Three bucks. You go downtown Santana Row, it's like eight dollars for the same beer. You're just like, what happened here? Well, this is San Jose, that's Santana Row. But so you run the query today in San Jose, you're gonna get three dollars. And you run it next week in Santana Row, it's gonna be ten dollars or something. And the value's not gonna be right. So if you make the two subqueries and you put it together and you run it all at the same time, you get the same value, the right value. So this is gonna substitute a price in. And so you're going to select a bar from cells where the beer is equal to Miller, and the price is going to be equal to whatever this value comes out at. So don't be afraid to use subqueries. This is a comparison with an equals for a single value return on a relation. And we're going to come back with one price. We can come back with more than one price. We could come back with a star, an asterisk. It's going to give us all the prices. And then we would have to use an in operator. So what we're looking at here is an equals operator, which is a simple single equals. So people that do programming, they want to put a double equals in there. Or it's equal equal, which is how you would do a comparison operator in practically every language. Because you never want to do an equals because that's an assignment expression. So you have to kind of break past that one and just use a single equals. But also then you have to go, and this is row, not toe. I just noticed a typo here. The toe, okay, the row in a relation 
is true if and only if the rho is a member of the relation. So rho not in gives you the opposite, so it's not in the relation. So the in expression here can appear in the where clause. So the relation is often in the subquery, so let's take a look at this here. A little different coloring, which is kind of weird. So in. So we got from beers, where we have the manufacturer, the name of manufacturer, and likes, where we have the drinker and beer. Find the names of the manufacturer of each beer that Fred likes. Okay, so here's the here's the, here's what we would do first, and this is what the query is actually going to do first. The query engine is going to take all the subqueries first, and then works inward out. So it's going to find a result for the subquery and then apply it to the outer query. So select beer from likes where the drinker is equal to Fred. I think Fred likes a lot of beer. So Fred's going to have Bud, Bud Light, Heineken, all these beers that are going to come back out. So this is going to be the set of beers that Fred likes. And then we're going to go and select star from beers where the name is in here. So then we're going to get more than one that's probably going to come out of here. So, and we have to use the in. If we used an equal, the SQL engine would come back and give us an error message. And the error message would read, and this is a joke, the error message would read, don't drink beer, it's bad for your health. <laughs> no, actually, the error message would read, sorry, in a, in, inadequate or insufficient query or query error of some sort, and it's not going to make any sense to you. If it had just told you that beer was bad for your health, that you could probably understand and comprehend. Instead, it's going to say aura error number 95262 insufficient query result output. What? You know, so it's going to be something that's going to be totally unreadable. Uh, and it's only going to be because you put an equal sign here instead of an in because it doesn't, the subquery is not going to come back with uh, one value, it's going to come back with many. And the interesting thing is that with SQL, not like programming languages, there's no error checking. You just write the query. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Because you had a typo. I'm not going to tell you whether the statement's valid or invalid. As long as you put a semicolon at the end, it's going to read it in like it's a valid statement. And sometimes it does wrong things because the logic's wrong. Okay, we also have this exists operator. So we an exists a relation if is true if and only if the relation is not empty. So existence is the test to see if you're here or not. It's kind of like attendance. <laughs> there exist students if they sign the attendance roster. <laughs> so, there exists in the database if it comes back true. So being a Boolean valued operator is going to come back true or false. So the exists can appear in the where clause. As an example, so from beers, name and manufacturer, find those beers that are the unique beer by their manufacturer. If they exist, they're going to be the unique beer. So here's an example query with the exists, and this one's going to be not exist. So we're out because we want to find unique beers. So we're going to do the opposite. So it's unique if it doesn't exist in there. So here we have the set of beers with the same manufacturer as B1, but not the same beer. And this query is actually kind of interesting because it's imposing a new test here. The subquery is using B1 and B1 is defined in the outer query. So the other query we looked at were two separate queries in themselves. They have produced different results, completely separated. Here we've combined the concept of the alias and we've taken it from the inner to the outer and we've used it in the inner. It's within the same scope. So notice the scope rules the manufacturer refers to the closed nested from with the relation to having that attribute. So manufacturer is going to be from beers, which is interesting because now we've got this guy coming from here and then we got this guy coming from here on the outer query. And we're like, how do you know the difference? Well, this is because we're relying upon the scope rules to tell us which beer we're talking about, which manufacturer we're talking about. So notice the SQL not equals to operator in here. This is equivalent to not equals, which is the opening and closing which is you get in most programming languages as well. Opening and closing brackets, and here we have the equals. So we're doing a select star from beers where manufacturer is equal to B1 manufacturer, and name is not equal to B1.name. Name and manufacturer are both coming from beer. And B1, B1 is coming from beers, B1 out here. So it's a query onto itself again, and we're going from an inner query is using an outer query alias, which is kind of interesting. 
So the scope rules are telling us where we're looking at the inner and where we're looking at the outer, which is also kind of interesting when you think about it. Yeah? Uh-huh. Well, the output is supposed to tell us it's going to find those beers that are the unique beers by their manufacturer. So if it's not in here, it's going to end up being a unique beer. Because out here in the outer query, we're selecting the name of the beer. We're going to get a list of names of beers that are unique. Because they're not going to, because if they match something already, they're going to be tossed out. They're not going to end up in the results. And they're going to be tossed out with a comparison of the table against itself. Because we're going to take this outer B1 here, and we're, gonna, we're, go, we're going, is it not in? It does it not exist in here. If it doesn't exist in here, it must be unique. And in here, it's just a query again on the same table, <laughs> which is kind of weird. The, the, the query itself is kind of odd, but it's very effective, which is going to end up being the case in most of the queries that you write. You look at the query. If it's a straightforward query, there's no challenge. If you can write a query like this, then you go, oh, this is great. And then you look at that and go, what is it doing? That's for documentation. Well, this gives us all the unique beers. <laughs> that, uh, and then uh, knowing what B1 is is also a good thing because further down the road, you have a query sub. This is simple, two queries. You can put a subquery inside of a query, inside of a query, inside of a You can nest this as deep as you want. In fact, we could put a subquery in here if we wanted to, and then a subquery in there if we wanted to. And then we got to work it backwards, and then what's B1? <laughs> so. It always goes the inside out. So it'll always find the, it brings all this stuff in. It, the query processor will read in the query line by line, organize it, work from the inside out. So it'll pick the innermost query because it has to substitute the result, substitute the result, substitute the result, all the way back to the main query. But the funny thing is, is it knows about the outside in the inside. And it knows about the scope of each one of the levels, which is kind of weird because it's thinking for you. It knows about something it hasn't even heard of before. Because in this query here, we don't have no B1 in anything. But it knows about it, which is kind of weird, I think. Because you'd think you'd have to redefine it or use it. But it's using the global query. Although you have two separate queries, it's treating it as one. <laughs> so it knows about everything as you're going through it. So Almost done, don't worry. Getting there. I'm going to go through... I'm going to go through two more. I'm going to go to slide number 44. I have a good stopping point coming up. <laughs> okay. I, I have a plan to this. <laughs> okay. So, because I know you guys want to get out of here. I, I want to get out of here too. I'm ready for dinner. The apple didn't hold out that long. No complaints about the apple. That was good. The operator any. So, we got any. So, this one was the exists and the non exists with the subqueries. I'll review some of this at the start tomorrow because I know I'm, I'm losing a lot of people right now just because they're tired. And we're going to build on these concepts tomorrow, so I'll review a little bit as well. But x is going to be equal to any relation. So it's a Boolean condition, meaning that x is equal to at least one row in the relation. It means it equals to something, anything in there. It comes in handy when it says, when you're trying to look for a needle in a haystack, and you go, is it in there? <laughs> is it? Oh, yes, it's in there. And it comes back true or false as a Boolean. Yes, that student is a member of this university. Okay, it's in the student table. Similarity is equal to can be placed by any of the comparison operators. Is it less than, greater than? So an example, S is larger than or equal to anything in this relation. It means that X is not smaller than any row in the relation. It's greater than or equal to. And note that the rows must have one component only to them if you're going to use an equal. So an equals is this item is equal to this item over here. Works with the any or the all. Any or all of them. So it's kind of like a cross-section or a com combination, a union of both together, all of them. So similarity x does not equal all in the true if, if and only if every row in the, in the first relation is in the, re is in the relation and x is not equal to the first, first one of the, of, the, of the rows. So that is x is not a member of the relation, but it's equal to. So... The not equal to can be replaced by any of the comparison operators, again, using a greater than or equal to all or an equals to all or less than all. It means that there's no row larger than, this larger than or equal to means that there's no 
no row larger than x in the relation. So let's look at the example. Put the pieces together here. This one's got the larger than or equals to all. So in this example from sales, and sales has bar, beer, and price. Find the beer sold for the highest price. So the beer sold for the highest price. So select beer from sales where the price is larger than or equal to all. And then the subquery here is all select price from sales. So you're getting the, all of the prices from sales. And the price has to be larger than or equal to every single one of those prices. So you can possibly imagine this as a whole list, like $5, $4, $3, $2, $9. And so the price from the outer sales must not be less than any price inside here. So it has to be greater than or equal to one of those prices in there for the query to return. So it's going to take all of the things in here. So it's going to say, give me the student with the highest GPA so we can take and query all the students in the student table and figure out what their GPAs are. And then we write an outer query that says, select the student from the same table where the GPA is larger than or equals to all of the other ones. <laughs> and then we get the highest, essentially, or the equal to the highest, whatever. If there's a lot of people with 4.0, we'll get 4.0, so it'll be the highest. I'll leave you with that. <clears throat> so tomorrow at 9 to 9.15, we're going to do our lovely attendance again. <laughs> and we'll pick up where we left off with more exciting, huh? We are what? Yeah, if you guys come in with a hangover, I will totally understand. No, no, no. Oh, now we're hungover. Now I feel like I need a beer is what I feel like. <laughs>